Hallelujah. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. First service was much better. Let's try that again. Hallelujah. The Lord is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of you all, this is your favorite day of the year. In fact, you were really depressed going away from last resurrection because you have to wait another 365 days before we get to celebrate it again. But good news, resurrection just isn't a day. It's a season. It's not just a season. It's the life that we live when we give our life to Jesus. And some of you, you're just so excited about Resurrection uh, Sunday and just what the Lord's going to do. Uh, you're, you're, <laughs> what you give your kids and your grandkids or your friends, what you give them is not a chocolate bunny. You give them a chocolate cross. And on that chocolate cross is a little banner that says something like this. No bunny loves you like Jesus. <laughs> or be happy in God. <laughs> That's what you do. For some, you just are excited about this day. You've been waiting for this for a long time. For others... This is your first time in church, and you're wondering why you're even here. Even now, as we started the worship, you, you're sweating. It's like, what am I doing here? But the reason why you're here is maybe somebody invited you, uh, somebody promised you a second date, or maybe a, <laughs> a meal after the service. But regardless, uh, you come in here, this is a little bit weird. Why are people raising their hands? Do they have a question? Are they waving at Jesus? Do they want to give Jesus a high five? What's happening? Uh, regardless, if you've been at resurrection services for 80 years, or this is your first one, we are so grateful that you're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because what we're celebrating here is the resurrection of Jesus, which means that he is fully alive. And as we put our trust in him, we are fully alive. We're made like him, like him we rise. And that's the good news of resurrection. But maybe for some of you here this morning, you feel like, I'm not fully alive. I don't feel fully alive. I feel fully frustrated, fully disappointed, fully discouraged. And I'm not sure what to do about that. And when I look at my life, all I see is just frustration after another. Take heart, you're not alone. There are two history makers, culture shapers, that would resonate with where you're at right now. One, Shakespeare. The other, Mel Brooks. <laughs> Shakespeare says this, each new morn, New widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face. Every morning, new widows are crying out. Every morning, new orphans are, are, are calling because of the pain and situation that they find themselves in. Every new morn, new sorrows strike heaven in the face. Shakespeare, Mel Brooks, life stinks. <laughs> life stinks. One's more poetic, the other one just gets right to the point. But regardless, you're here this morning and Fully being alive isn't where you're at. In fact, where you're at is in a situation in your life where it wasn't supposed to be this way. You went through high school and you had these dreams about what you were going to become, about the job that you are going to take, about the spouse that you were going to marry, about the location in the United States that you want to live, live in, or maybe globally. There was another location that you wanted to be in. But regardless, you had dreams, you had hopes in high school. And for some reason, whether it was something that you did, decisions you made, or decisions other people made that affected you, your dreams and your hopes that you had so long ago aren't going to come to fruition. You look at your life and say, it was not meant to be this way. This week, I've been spending a lot of time with my best friend who's got stage four cancer. And as I'm with him, I thought about this message. I thought it's not supposed to be this way. We read the news this morning where there was a bombing in Sri Lanka. You see all those people that are being killed, hundreds of people. You look at the news, you think it's not supposed to be this way. Maybe that's where you're at this morning. The circumstances that you find yourself in, the situation that you're dealing with in life right now, it was not meant to be this way. The good news here is that we, what we see in Mark is that, again, you're not alone in this because the first witnesses of the resurrection would say the same thing. The very first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ would say it was not meant to be this way. How do I know that? Verses 1 and 3 of chapter 16 of Mark Bible says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after the sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? Now, they're going to the tomb because they expect Jesus to be in it, which meant that all their hopes, all their aspirations, all of their dreams for who Christ is in their life. You look at these women. They had had their life transformed by the ministry of Jesus. Mary Magdalene had seven demons removed from her. 
And each one of them could tell a story about how Christ had radically transformed their life. They expected him to be the king of kings, and a king is not meant to end in a grave. As the women are going to the tomb, they're saying to themselves, it wasn't meant to be this way. Last chapter, or last verse of the chapter, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. They were afraid. It wasn't supposed to be this way. It wasn't supposed to end like this. And we know this based upon their reaction is that the deeper the relationship, the deeper the disappointment. They were close to Jesus. And some of you could tell your story. The deepest disappointment in your life, the deepest hurt has come from that deep relationship. Where there was a betrayal, something went, ha- something went wrong. And as a result, you find yourself lonely or in a different place than where you thought you would be. Also, if you look at the women, they are going to the place where their dreams died. They're standing over the tomb of uh, the death of their desires and dreams. And for some of you here this morning, you are standing over the grave of your disappointment and you're staring it right in the face. And the good news on Resurrection Sunday, the good news is this, that while the women were walking, Jesus was working. In verse 3, they're wondering, they're frustrated, who will roll away the stone as they're walking to the tomb? But even as they're walking in verse 4, The stone had already been rolled away from the tomb. That is to say that when they were walking in their worry, Jesus was already working his sovereign power. When they were walking in their disappointment, Jesus was already working his hope and joy into them. And they didn't even know it. They were just walking in frustration. So for us here, as you're walking through a time in your life where you're saying it wasn't supposed to be this way, know this, that the Lord is working in you and he is walking with you. He hasn't abandoned you. He hasn't left you. Even in your walking into despair, he is working in your life. The stone was rolled away, not so Jesus would go out, but so the women could get in and see that Jesus was no longer there. In fact, God was working. God is on the move. Resurrection says this, that while we're working and walking in difficult times in our life, Jesus is working his miraculous power in us and through us. Now, what is the work that he's doing? What are the gifts that he gives in resurrection? two things. He gives us grace in the moment, and he gives us hope for the future. Let me say that again. Listen, while you're walking in your disappointment and frustration, God is working in you. He's giving you two things, grace in the moment and hope for the future. First, he gives us grace in the moment. Verses uh, six and seven. Don't be alarmed, the angel said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now, the question becomes is, is why Galilee? And why is Jesus responding this way? Jesus, just three days earlier, the closest friends had deserted him when when, when, when he needed them the most. But notice what Jesus doesn't say in this passage. He doesn't say, tell those no good, faithless, backstabbing cowards to meet me in Galilee. And if they grovel long enough, maybe, maybe I will forgive them. But I don't know. He doesn't say that. He doesn't tell the disciples to come groveling in Galilee. He says, tell the disciples and Peter to meet me in Galilee. Why Galilee? Because Galilee was the place where Jesus performed the greatest amount of his miracles. Galilee was the place where the greatest level of authority, his power, his compassion was, re- was revealed. Also, it was in Galilee, listen, it was in Galilee where the disciples got their call from Jesus. So in telling the disciples to be met, to, that he will meet them in Galilee, is just saying this, I'm going to renew your call. I'm going to restore you to your rightful place. Yes, you denied me. You left me when I needed you most. You fell asleep when I asked you to stay awake. But take heart. Meet me in Galilee. He's restoring their call. Then the next question is, is why Peter? Why single him out? Why the disciples and Peter? Because we know this, that Peter denied Jesus three times. And imagine what Peter's response would have been if Jesus didn't single him out. What if Jesus were to say, tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee? Peter would have probably said something like this. You guys go on ahead. I've denied Jesus when he needed me most. I turned my back on him three times. When he says, 
for the disciples to meet him, he certainly doesn't need me. Certainly, he's not talking about me. I'm just going to go back to fishing. But Jesus, in his kindness, in his grace, gives grace in the moment. He says, tell the disciples and Peter. He's given them grace in the moment. He's restoring their call. He's putting them under a right place. He's saying, yes, I know you turned your back on me, but I haven't turned my back on you. I'm giving you grace in the moment. Tell the disciples and Peter. Tell the disciples and put your name in the blank. Tell the disciples and you, I'm meeting you in Galilee. I'm restoring you as a person. I'm giving you a new call. Even though you've left me, I'm not leaving you. And some of you here this morning, you're thinking about ditching Jesus altogether. Because if you've cried out in the seasons of your life, it wasn't supposed to be this way. Know this, he's given you a word today. That he has not abandoned you. He's given you grace in the moment. That's the first thing. The second is, is that he gives us hope for the future. Verse 6. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. <laughs> and all God's people said, Amen. yes, he's risen. He's risen from the grave. He's no longer there, which means he is in his glorified form. Death, sin, and hell have been conquered through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection three days later. His resurrection means? that what we have to look forward to when he comes back again is the eradication, in the words of J.R. Tolkien, the eradication of all things that are untrue. He will take all things that are sad and make them untrue. And he is restoring a new heavens and a new earth. Sudden infant death syndrome, gone. Cancer, gone in the name of Jesus. Bombings at churches, gone. Alzheimer's, gone. Mental illness, gone. All things that plague the world in which we live, all of those things that are not true, are not right, will be gone. That's good news. But it's not only true that all that is wrong in this world, all that is evil will be gone, but it's also true that we who put our trust in Jesus will experience a glorified new heavens and new earth. We will be glorified. We'll have glorified bodies. We'll have a glorified experience. I mean, imagine, what will a glorified Hawaii be like? If Maui right now is, is tainted with the curse, what will a glorified Maui be? I mean, imagine biting into a glorified ribeye. I mean, <laughs> if a ribeye is cursed now, what will a glorified ribeye taste like? Glorified chicken wings from B-dubs dipped in blue cheese. What will a glorified salt and vinegar chips taste like? What will a glorified mango taste like? What will a glorified Cabernet or Chardonnay taste like? It's all right. We're not Baptists, we're Anglican. Those things are going to be glorified in the name of Jesus. <laughs> All things made new. That's what we're looking forward to, nothing less. New heavens, new earth is where ice cream will be good for you and Brussels sprouts will make you gain weight. That's what we're looking forward to. Who wants in? Who's ready to go? Let's do it. Let's do it. That's what we have. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. We not only have grace in the moment, but we also have the hope of the resurrection. Now, the hope of the resurrection means at least three things. First, spiritual newness. Second, relational newness. Third, physical newness. First, spiritually made new. We will be made like him. Like him, we will rise. Great quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, he will make the feeblest and filthy of us into dazzling, radiant, immortal creatures, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine a bright stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly, though, of course, on a smaller scale, his own boundless power and delight and goodness. The process will be long and in parts very painful, but that is what we're in for, nothing less. Spiritual newness. We will reflect back unto God his own boundless power and glory. Not only spiritual newness, but also relational newness. I've been meditating on a verse this week, um, Isaiah 49, 22 says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon to the nations. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their hips. Now, the context of that passage in Isaiah 49 is when Israel had been captured and they took especially the sons and the daughters, the young girls and the young boys, and they took them off to captivity. But the hope that Isaiah 49 gives us is that those kids that were taken off into exile will be brought back and reunited with their parents. 
That's not only true in the Old Testament. It's not only true in the New Testament. It is going to be true in our hope when Christ comes back again. There will be relational newness, which means if you have lost a child, if you have lost a loved one, the hope we have in Christ is that we will see the angels carrying those young ones in their arms and on their hips for a reunion with their parents. If you as a child has lost a parent or you as a parent have lost a child and it, to an untimely death, and by the way, every death is untimely. But the hope of the resurrection is we experience spiritual newness, relational newness, all things being glorified. Lastly, we experience physical newness. We get glorified bodies. Can't you wait? I mean, it's just, let's, get, let's do it. Glorified bodies. Every resurrection, when we get to this part, I, just, I think about Johnny Erickson Tata and what she had experienced. Some of you may know the story, but when she was 18 years old, she had a diving accident. accident. She dove into a lake, hit her head on the bottom of a lake, cracked her neck, neck and became a quadriplegic. So from 18 years on, she was paralyzed. Before she was paralyzed, she went to a Reformed Episcopal church where kneeling was really, really important. But after she had been paralyzed, she could no longer kneel. She recounts in one of her books that when she was at a conference, the leader, after they led during a time of, of worship and conversation, he invited everybody to kneel on the floor. And Johnny Erickson taught her realizing that she can't kneel because she's paralyzed. First, she began to experience sadness. And then she was mad because it was not meant to be this way. Not meant to be this way. I wasn't meant to be quadriplegic. I wasn't meant to be paralyzed. I want to kneel down just as everybody else is kneeling. It wasn't supposed to be this way. But then she remembered the resurrection. when she writes in her book this, thinking about the resurrection in light of her current state, she says, Sitting there, I was reminded that in heaven I will be free to jump and dance and kick and do aerobatics. And although I am sure Jesus will be delighted to watch me rise on tiptoe, there is something I plan to do that may please him more. If possible, somewhere, sometime before the party gets going, sometime before the guests are called to the banquet table at the wedding feast of the Lamb, the first thing I plan to do on resurrection legs is to drop down on grateful, glorified knees, and I will quietly kneel at the foot of Jesus. This is the hope we have in Christ, nothing less. Spiritual newness, relational newness, physical newness. If you are in a place here this morning where you're saying it wasn't supposed to be this way, may we take hope in the resurrection because what the resurrection gives us is grace in the moment and hope for the future. And that hope for the future will not be taken away because Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And now we are going to celebrate with a baptism. Cara, come on up, sister.